Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming to this seminar, The Future of Economy. Um, we've got a panel of really interesting experts to discuss this really exciting issue, particularly now as regenerative agriculture becomes more and more important and we have to ask the question, where do we look for the right advice? And we're going to start with Gary Markham from Land Family Business to set the scene and then we'll go to Annie Howard, as you all know, is a Nuffield Scholar and farmer in Kent. And then lastly, we'll have Mark Jews, who is also a Nuffield Scholar and an agronomist with Agri. So I'll ask Gary to start, and then we'll take questions at the end, if there are any burning questions at the end of Gary's uh, introduction, and then we'll move on to Andy, and if you've got a burning question again, you can take one or two questions between speakers. Okay. Good, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm not a Nuffield Scholar. So, but I'm an accountant. So, uh, the future of agronomy, I don't know why I'm here. I'm not, I'm not an agronomist, and I'm obviously with three agronomists. But uh, we do benchmark uh, quite, a, quite a few farms, and uh, we benchmark traditional farming. Uh, we also benchmark um, regenerative agriculture group as well, which is quite interesting. So, I just want to set the scene um, with four slides, basically, a few, a few minutes. Uh, to look at uh, some of the background to why I think uh, we're all here looking at regenerative agriculture. So that's me, um, so this should be the next slide. So what we've got here is um, uh, are the numbers from our traditional uh, uh, benchmarking group, which are about 100,000 acres in total uh, for uh, uh, arable farming, mainly in the east. So basically the reliance on BPS, uh, that just to show you some numbers and on why this is in focus. So um, we've got uh, 19 harvest and the 20 harvest. You can see how the 20 harvest has been really bad results on many of our clients' farms. And so the average reliance on BPS was 84%. In the 19 harvest, 147% in the 20 harvest, you can see. And this is the focus of many of, many of our clients. The top 25, interestingly enough, is 53 in both years. So, uh, and so that's, that's some of the focus of, of uh, the discussions I'm having with, with our clients. I think the other thing I'd like to talk about in, 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 a, in a few seconds is the actual capital we have. Uh, so we've got the land capital and also the amount of money tied up in, uh, in agriculture. So uh, an acre, sorry, so dealing in acres because that's after Brexit rather than hectares. So um, an acre of land, Average 10,000 could be eight, eight to 12,000, um, of course. So I think the key thing is, uh, if you work out the maths, the break-even economic value. So if we were in Australia now, that that would be 4,000, okay, or, or in America. But because we're in the UK, land is eight to 12,000 an acre. So, so that's 6,000 extra, if you like, capital, no economic return in terms of farming, apart from if you have a crop of chimneys or houses, then obviously it comes good. But in terms of arable farming, it just sits there, basically. So I think that's a, a useful bit of background. So I want to now look at what's been happening with our clients uh, in the eastern counties and what we've been doing um, outside of regions of agriculture is trying to expand, to try to grow bigger, economies of scale, spreading our fixed costs. So, and I think that these are actual figures. So, what we've got here is figures over the last few harvests, okay? Um, pounds per acre, arable profit on the left-hand side, we've got zero in the middle. So, in-hand farming, okay? And, and we're looking at mainly the margin from arable farming, which is the five variable costs, seed, fertilizer, chemicals, labor, and machinery. Uh, because we can't compare many farms below that because different lifestyles, uh, going to the races, uh, ladies, and, and etc., all, all the rest of it that goes goes with some 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 farming enterprises apparently. So um, so we've got in-hand farming down to arable production because that's what we're here looking at. Contract farming because you have to tender for more land. Quite often, and these are actual figures. If you work out the maths, you lose money out of that extra bit, unless you're lucky. On average, 
top 25 percent in the group actually there are people who do, who do make positive margins but on average when you expand you've had to tender for that more land key money and then so contract farmed minus 66 per acre and these are actual figures um, and the total on the right hand side is minus two and on our stand up there i've got handouts showing you these these actual numbers over the last few harvests so again what we've done is try to expand no, nothing wrong with that trying to do what we're doing so but there is there is what's the answer and there is another way and this is why we're here so going on to my last slide okay um, we're looking at the numbers we have from conventional uh, benchmarking to regen ag benchmarking okay so which is this so here we have and this sums up um, the, the question to to these chaps as well so conventional 175 pound per acre this is variable costs key point about the problem we have in arable farming is the machinery capital per hectare per acre. Okay, 320 pounds per acre of machinery, which, which is huge. Um, and, that, and that, in my opinion, destroys the viability of standard arable farming. So, um, moving on top of the line, the conventional, the, the, the arrow goes to re, Regen Ag. Variable cost 144, that's from our Regen Ag benchmarking group. Okay, machinery capital around about £200 per acre. So, future of agronomy, um, I think, uh, it is, is the moving from the left of that screen to the right of the screen. Okay, the other point about this, if you've got less variable costs, less machinery, on 750 acre farm, you've got around about 100,000 less of capital. Still got the land capital, but the working capital, £100,000 less. Uh, working capital. So just to summarise where I think um, is the agronomist the right person to deliver the change? I think they are personally but uh, you'll hear from them. The point is we've got we've got goal posts being moved all the time um, without being told the rules. So like in a game of rugby the goal posts are up the side and we'll tell you the rules later chaps. So, um, so I, I think, yes, the, the agronomists are the key people to make the change because they're on the land all the time and from, from the experience of my clients, helping farmers on the left-hand side getting off the treadmill without breaking their leg on the way to the right-hand side, I think is the key. But I think, just to summarise, I think agronomists in the future need to be therapists and psychologists as well to help people make that change. So let's move on to the psychologists and the therapists. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Gary. Is there any uh, burning question out there before we move on, or if I, uh, if not, I'll ask a question. Okay, could you just talk a bit more about the margins and how they vary between the regenerative and uh, conventional system? Yes, of course. Yes, uh, I've only had a, fit, a brief, a brief introduction. Yeah. So we've got the costs there. So um, the, the margins. Um, so. It, the, the, and the margins we look at are after the variable costs, uh, the labour and machinery. So the five variable costs, seed, fertiliser, chemicals, labour and machinery. That's where we benchmark at this stage because, as I said, all farms are different in terms of their cost structures below that line. And we just need to focus, focus on that line. So um, it, the, the, the margins are very similar. And actually the latest figures we've got based on the 20 harvest, okay, um, the Groundswell Group, if you like, which is about a dozen to 15 regen agriculture farms in the States, um, the, the net margin at that level is, level is £11 per acre, whereas our standard benchmarking on all the rest of our uh, clients is £3 per acre. So, but on, on, on average, Richard, I would say that the, the margins are similar. Okay, less costs, different way of farming, and the margins are similar. But in terms of the latest 20 harvest, um, it's uh, 11 pounds per acre versus three pound per acre. Thank you. Okay, just one, yeah, one very last question. In terms of livestock, obviously that's a key part of the system. How do you feel is a practical way of dealing with that within, within a benchmarking group or within, within the figures like yours? So livestock is, yeah, it's, it's fairly new on the scene. In, in, in our group, in the benchmarking group, and we historically we've excluded them. 
but we've now seen the light and, and the livestock are part of the rotation. Okay, so we are, we are, we are now um, looking at the livestock margins per hectare or per acre as part of the rotation, as a crop in a way. Um, and, and so, so they do come in. It, it, there's, there's a bit of creative, not creative, wrong word, creative accountancy thinking. Um, we, we have to, uh, because there's an overlap quite often with cover cropping, livestock, livestock on cover cropping can be a bit difficult to, to, to account for because you've got, you've got two margins in, in, in 18 months or two margins in 12 months, etc. But uh, we're bringing livestock in, into it now and it's, it's going to be part of that rotation uh, uh, the ongoing rotation margin. Uh, we've just started doing that in the last 12 months. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Gary. Um, are there any questions for Gary before? Yes. Back. So you just talked about um, therapists and psychologists. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you've got enough benchmark data to show conventional uh, operators the difference in cost and capital tied up, what do you think is the major impediment? To getting conventional farmers to start considering a regenerative approach series? That's a very, very good question. Thank you very much for asking that. That's that's my talk today in, in terms of on, on my stand. I'm talking to everybody about making that change from the, that top arrow at the top there. So, um, uh, the answer may be here, I don't know, but the, the, I think the key point is my experience in, in talking to quite a few agronomy groups when I was doing that, you know, 12 months ago, uh, talking to agronomy groups, quite a few, uh, quite a few farmers, um, tenant farmers, for example, um, who, you know, who, who have to pay a rent, um, tenant farm with an overdraft is a good example of getting off that treadmill. Um, the numbers are not enough. They're, they're, they're not. They're not. They're not convinced. And I've got quite a few clients, and I've heard it from audiences as well, up and down the country, saying, "Well, we tried it. The yield has dropped a little bit. Lost our nerve, and went back again, back again to flat out, pouring everything on. Um, so back to the left-hand side, if you like. So the numbers don't seem to be enough. So they need hand-holding." Now, my opinion is is that collaboration helps a lot in this, and I have many farming um, machinery syndicates around, all up and down the, the eastern counties, traditional farming syndicates. We don't have any regen ag farming syndicates yet, but if you think about a collaboration of half a dozen farmers, I think that would do the trick, because, because what you're doing then is, is you, you, you can hold your nerve, basically. I, I think a lot of it is in here basically it's holding your nerve and seeing it through. So, um, uh, uh, so it's in terms of knowledge exchange. So if a group of farmers did it, I think that would help. But on your own, of course the stats will help uh, and, and, and they do help, but they're not enough on their own. Farmers need a lot more than that in my experience. Does that answer it? Yeah, okay. What I'll do is I'll just let um, Andy and Mark also answer that question. Compactions in the head. That's the bit, biggest driver to change is in the head. I can't do it, I won't do it. Well, you won't succeed if you don't if you think like that. So for me, it's mostly, I know there's like external pressures like Gary was talking about, but um, you've got to be, fear of making mistakes is a huge one, isn't it? People don't want to have a bad looking field next to the road, but sometimes that's how you learn. Uh, I think fear, inertia, and a lack of knowledge, or a lack of available knowledge. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll come to talk about the, the agronomy uh, support industries, and uh, we'll have to try to evolve those support industries to try to address some of these more regenerative uh, principles and move from the support industry, that, or the support network that, that existed and has kind of evolved through 40 or 50 years of kind of dependency on, on chemical inputs. So, so that's something that I think we need to, to evolve and to, to kind of um, to improve in order to support this, this kind of transformation. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think you can definitely underestimate peer pressure. Um, that's definitely one thing which is huge. And also farming seasons are long enough that we have quite short term memory, so it's very easy to get things sometimes. Um, I'm going to hand over to Andy now to do his presentation. 
Hello, yeah, well I'm just going to introduce myself and give some a few ideas for debate. Um, so I, I see myself on mainly as a farmer to be honest. Um, I've been a farmer for 20 odd years. Um, but in 2015 I became a Nuffield Scholar. Um, that's probably one of the reasons I'm sat here, it's opened a lot of doors. Um, and I was finding myself asking lots of questions, doing lots of presentations. So I went home one night and thought, well, I better become an advisor and make some money out of this and stop giving it away free. Um, but, <laughs> so that's how I'm here, part of Groundswell Agronomy um, and Abacus as well. Um, <clears throat> but for me, for me, um, agronomy for the future, I'm not sure you're going to have one agronomist. Um, Regen agriculture really is such a huge subject that you're going to have a pesticide agronomist, you're going to have a biological agronomist, livestock advisor, soil scientist, environmental advisor, one-off site visit. I mean, one of the jobs I do is go to farms who want to transition to Regen and just you know write a report and give them advice, and I might ne never see them again. Um, I think there's, I think having that one person you have to give advice from or take advice from. It's probably coming to the end because not anyone, not everyone, can be an expert in everything, and I think that's quite. I fully admit that <laughs> I'm not an expert in everything, um, <clears throat> and I think the future of advice is going to be knowledge intensive, not input intensive. Um, there is so much that more you learn than less you realise you know. So um, I think that's very true in this, and no one, no one here knows all the answers yet. Um, I think it's agronomy in the future is going to have to go beyond basis facts and RB209. Um, I don't think they're part of it, but you know, should your agronomist be looking at bricks, redox, um, electric conductivity, um, all these other things? That should you be looking at tissue tests, sap testing? Um, just just getting the RB209 and putting your finger on what um, what uh, nitrogen you should be putting on, I don't think is very fit for the future. Um, not that I'd be able to and I, there's anything wrong with it, it's just, it's, it's just um, a baseline. <clears throat> independence, which Mark is going to come on to. Uh, should you be have an independent agronomist or a supply agronomist? I think for me it depends on the agronomist. Um, there's good and bad in both. I would prefer my agronomist is independent. Um, and I don't think independence counts if your company just splits itself in two and has one company that sells products and one company sells advice, um, for me that's still not independent. Um, <clears throat> another key for agronomy going future, I think it's going to be what, what Gary's talking about, promoting main instead of yen, margin instead of yield, because that is what we actually make our money from. We don't make our money from um, spending lots of money and getting a, in the middle of one 20 acre field and getting a massive, massive high yield. You make your money over the whole rotation, over the whole farm. Um, so I think that's going to be quite key in the future is margin, maybe margin um, instead of yield. Even though yield's not um, not unimportant, um, my, one of my worries, and I can see it happening now, how agronomy is evolving, is from selling pesticides to biostimulants to precision ag, um, giving us lots of data that we don't have got a clue what we're going to do with. Um, I think you've got to tread a little bit carefully as a farmer. Um, to where you spend your money. Um, there's lots of fancy pictures you can get on your on your gatekeeper, etc. But do they add much value? Some do, some don't. But my worry is that you know we're just shifting from bio pesticides to biostims, and just just be careful with that. Um, is your agronomist become going to become your drone pilot in the future? And how often will he have to come and see the fields? I think it's key that he will have to come and see the fields because you you can't see everything from a drone, but um, should he be checking your, your crops twice every other day with, with a drone, having a drone and looking at your, looking at your maps? Is your agronomist going to be doing that or should you be doing that yourself? Um, AI is, is coming, drone flights are coming. It's something that we can't ignore and I think the agronomist of the future is going to have to have to embrace that and in terms of cost, it's obviously a lot cheaper for the agronomist to have a, have a drone or, or buy a set of drones than it is to individual farmers. Um, for me, agronomists should be there in the future to help design trials and push change. Um, if your agronomist is scared of change, well then get rid of him. And it's, it's one of my slight worries with the, I don't know if Mark's going to talk about it, the um, agronomist having a share of the margin. 
um, which is talked about as a performance matrix. Um, if the agronomist is part of that, are they going to want to push change and push trials? Because trials might go wrong. Um, is that is that going to be in conflict? But I'd like my agronomist to be asking me the right questions and pushing pushing me to try new things rather than um, safe things. Um, I'd also, agronomists of the future, I know mine does it, <coughs> is to facilitate discussion groups. Gary mentioned it. Um, most agronomists have 15, 20 clients. Why aren't they in a room three, four times a year, sharing ideas, um, discussing what's been wrong? I think that's probably a key for the future as well. Um, so that's just a, a few pointers from me to discuss. Okay, um, are there any questions for Andy? Um, can I ask a question in terms of how do you put a value on that advice? So given that it's evolving and given that chemistry has historically sort of masked the true cost of agronomy and the way that that agronomy advice is, is going to be given it will be very different. How do you as a farmer put a value on that? Well, I know how much my agronomist charges per hectare and it's always too much, but um, that, it's, it's a difficult question. And again, it comes back to what, what, is, what is your agronomist actually doing on your farm? Is he there just to tell you your T0, T1, T2, T3 timings? Then if he is, then you know, not very much. Um, but if he's there doing a holistic outline of the farm and giving advice on everything else, cover crops, soil health, everything else, then I'm quite, quite happy to pay, um, pay more, because you're getting more. Um, but uh, putting a price to it, I think that's it's going to be difficult. So it's going to be obviously unique for each farm, but do you see that more as a way that you might pay your accountant or you might pay um, a solicitor that actually you're paying a fee per year or per hour? How do you, what, how would you think of that sort of concept? Uh, I, I think there's probably more than one way of doing it. I, I, I would like to say some people are happy with paying your accountant a set fee every year. Um, I'm not very happy, I'm not very keen on this margin and performance with agronomy because, to be honest, I don't always listen to everything he says, so it's not really his fault, that's my fault. Um, but uh, yeah, price for agronomy is, is going to be something that um, the market will, will find out, I suppose. With BPS going, you're going to have to justify that cost massively. Um, and I think transparency is probably going to be something that's key. Um, that we haven't I've kind of hinted on independence, but if you're not, if you've got a supply agronomy, you want to make sure that they haven't got um, 20,000 litres of tebiconazole XY in their shed, and that's why they're giving you a, a recommendation of that one. Um, there needs to be transparency between agronomist and the farmer. We could do a very, uh, yes. Um, how, how involved do you think the agronomist is in the, in the financial side of the business? I think that's probably going to depend on the farmer. Um, I don't particularly, my, my agronomist doesn't particularly get involved in the financial side because that's because I'm happy to do with it myself. Um, but I think that will depend on the farmer. Um, but they should have an idea of how good or bad you're doing. I think you know, if they've got access to your gatekeeper, then they should be able to see what's really going on. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so on the on the uh, on the financial aspect of, of agronomy, then it's absolutely crucial. You know, you, you, you need to know all of the margins and responses to the to the inputs that you're using, uh, as has been mentioned. And ma uh, margin is far more important than yield. Um, and it d does depend very much on different relationships. You quite often agronomists are working as a uh, subcontracted decision maker for agronomic advice on a farm. Um, uh, th there's a lot of diversification out on farms and a lot of uh, arable farmers aren't solely interested or solely uh, occupied with running a, a, a business growing crops. Many people are doing lots of other things. And that is one of the reasons why uh, agronomists get subcontracted out to, to, to make that financial decision making or that agro agronomic decision making, which has a financial um, sort of uh, you know implication. 
Um, and yeah, Anne has mentioned about the, I, I wasn't going to talk about much about it today to be honest, but about the, about the margin sharing idea that I've been putting forward. I, I think that can work on, on a relationship where you are effectively the, the arable manager on a farm, which is you know, probably not very many people here today, but there's, there's a lot of subcontracted um, uh, management arrangements which exist with agronomists. And in, in those circumstances, then I think a, a margin share or a profit incentivized uh, approach could work. But I think what I'll come on to talk about a bit more is accountability in, in all its forms. Uh, not not just financial. So, I think there's we talked about the fear of the farmers of change, but there's also, as agronomist, a fear. If you haven't got that close relationship with your with your client, you probably you err on the safe side. Um, so I think that's probably key. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think there's a there's a psychology uh, element to this as well, and um, if you are a unaccountable decision maker. Um, spending somebody else's money, then the, the temptation is to, to take a very risk-averse approach. But if you are involved in that risk assessment and you are you agree on the brief with your with your with your sort of uh, employer in this instance, then then you can take a, a group uh, decision on on the on the kind of approach to risk. But if somebody says just get on with that and make the fields clean, then it's very difficult to to take a very um, sort of nuanced, in-depth look at the risk associated with each and every decision made that, that can be made. Okay, thank you, Mark. I'm just going to let Gary make a comment, and then we'll come to your presentation. Thanks. Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, so we look after thousands of acres, in, in preparing preparing accounts, and I think that apart from within the Groundswell Group, where we've been fairly active and close to, to benchmarking, where we do raise with agronomists across the board we never hear from them um, so uh, so in terms of the benchmarking we do um, which is all the figures per hectare per acre etc uh, variable costs we benchmark we never hear from uh, our clients agronomists and it's pro and, we, and i would welcome it absolutely welcome it okay over to you mark okay so um I was going to try to talk a little bit about what a um, good agronomist might look like in the future. And since uh, agronomist became the word that we use to describe the person who comes to inspect your crops regularly and prescribe whatever the inputs uh, were considered necessary, then the main way of judging the success of that person's work has been uh, how clean the fields are. And with as the main tool that we have to achieve that has been the use of pesticides, then that's what we've used. Um, and with not much in the way of accountability to that process, then we've increased our use of pesticides. And you know, this graph over the last near 30 years comes from a pesticide use survey. And it shows that we, we treat crops more often than we did 30 years ago, um, and that's you know, so we've got a greater number of treated hectares, and a lot of the figures that you will have seen that get uh, that get shown in the in this context is showing a fall in um, amount of pesticide by weight that's been applied. But unfortunately, in the last decade, that that um, that trend has reversed, and we're actually you know putting more pesticide on by weight as well as as well as the number of treatments per hectare. So that's. That's a, a situation that, as agronomists, we've helped farmers to get into. You know, we, we are now in a situation where most arable farmers, I would argue, are very heavily reliant on inputs. And through a whole range of uh, kind of um, influences, that's under a lot of pressure. That, that reliance on, in, in, on, on inputs is under a lot of pressure through changing attitudes, through legislation, we've got Henry Dimbleby there just about to put through his part two of his um, national food strategy. We've got the European Union's farm to uh, fork strategy targeting a 50% reduction in inputs in by 2030. Now, you know, we're not in Europe now, but we, we won't escape that pressure. And uh, between Henry Dimbleby and the, and the National Action Plan for the Sustainable Use of Pesticides, I would be surprised if we don't end up with some specific uh, reduction targets associated with pesticide use. That's not to mention the loss of 
uh, active ingredients and the shift in sensitivity uh, and resistance. So all of those things um, uh, taken into account and, and the, the, the infrastructure that has uh, evolved to support that sort of a, a production system um, bring us to ask, well, are the skills that we have now, do they transfer into a, a more regenerative farming model? And I've been an agronomist for 25 years in the uh, independent and, uh, and now in the trade sector. Um, and I've noticed, I've been surprised by the level of dependence that we've already talked about that, that sometimes exists between farmers and their agronomists. And it's, a, you know, it's interesting, Gary asks, is the agronomist the person to lead that change? And I'd say, no, no, the farmer is the person to lead that change. And the agronomist is there to help them with the sort of tools that, that Andy's pointing out, you know, the, the, the greater um, uh, use of technology for, for bricks testing and, and all, these, all these slightly newer uh, concepts that are moving away from what I trained with, what I, what I learned about, and which is really to kind of decipher the complexity of pesticide use. And that's where, that's where the, the history of, of uh, the modern form of agronomist has, has come from. And, and I think we will need to develop and evolve those services. And, you know, I've no doubt that, that, um, far, that the agronomy companies and agronomists will bring forward uh, new and innovative uh, services with, with soil health and biologicals and genetics, and, and just as Andy says, you, you, you don't really want to necessarily swap one set of inputs for, for a new non-pesticide set of inputs. And, and we, we're looking at a more of a, a systems-based uh, approach rather than a product-based approach. And that's going to take a, a different level of support from, a, from, a, from the infrastructure that exists within the agronomy support sector. Um, and you as farmers will need to uh, assess what value your agronomy partners are bringing to that to that uh, to that equation, um, and and in order to do that, I think you're going to need some lines of established kind of accountability. Um, and we've talked about about the financial accountability. So I've been trying to get something off the ground around uh, around the financial accountability where we are subcontracted managers of of, uh, of of the agronomic decision making, but there's. There's more to that, and there's a lot of informal accountability where where you'll interrogate the agronomist and, and have really in-depth discussions about which why you've made the decisions that you've made, and I think that's very healthy. Um, but there's also uh, the the sort of responsibility and the accountability of the managing of the of the inputs that we're using, but particularly the pesticides that we're using, which is going to come under more scrutiny with with the change in legislation. And the pesticide use survey figures I just put up a minute ago, they, they, they're the best we've got on an aggregate scale, but they are three years out of date. They're, they come from a small sample of, uh, aggregate, of, of extrapolated data. Um, they take no account of different forms of pesticide use. And, and one thing I've been keen to try to, um, to introduce is this concept of the treatment frequency index, where, where we are uh, measuring the amount of pesticide we use in a, in a, in a slightly better way. Uh, these figures on this graph are just from one field on my farm. Um, where we, and, and so the treatment frequency index is the cumulative number of equivalent full rate pesticide doses. And it's not perfect, um, but it does show, it, it does relate back to uh, a, a comparative equivalence of different pesticides insofar as it uses the the maximum full rate uh, application uh, as as a as a reference point. So so there is some account made of the of the safety of that particular product, and it's very simply generated. You can, if we could get our software providers to provide us with this information, we could have comparative data so that we could compare farm to farm, agronomist to agronomist, different company approaches to different company approaches, and I think that level of accountability is really important to try to help to incentivize and to monitor and manage our process towards a more regenerative um, system which has a lower a lower reliance on pesticide inputs and that's all i came to say really. but I'll, I'll answer any questions okay are there any questions for mark 
Um, can I ask a question? So we talked about um, peer pressure with farmers adopting regenerative agriculture. How do you see peer pressure playing out amongst agronomists in relation to regenerative agriculture? I think it's become mainstream now. So, you know, it, it, it is no longer a, an oddity in terms of the agronomy support sector. Uh, there's clearly quite a few agronomists who specialise in heavily, but I don't really count myself among those yet. You know, I, I, think, I, I think I will and I, I, I need to develop in that area and, and I think I will do. But it's no longer a, a peculiarity, I would say. Um, and, and it's becoming a necessity. If, if your customer says, I'd like to develop some regenerative practices on my farm, and you say, I'm, I don't think that'll work, I'm not interested, then I think you've got a good chance of losing, losing that client. So I think it's become a necessary part of, of our job. And to be fair, it's, it's more interesting. Uh, you know, the, the, the kind of input reliant um, uh, sort of model is, is it's quite boring when you when you've um, when you've got the hang of it, uh, and, I, and I, I never say I've properly got the hang of it because I make mistakes every year. But 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 it is quite a boring sort of a process, and and it it's less satisfying in terms of um, not accounting for the external costs. You know, we, we've, I th I'm I'm far more aware of that than I was five years ago. Um, but I don't think I don't think it is still. Uh, widely recognised the level of external cost that exists with the, with the reliance of, uh, that we have on inputs. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the interesting things with um, recently starting the Groundswell Agronomy Service is I've noticed um, very often when talking to people there's, there's a real um, disconnect between the relationship between the, the landowner and the agronomist and, and I always sort of like it to um, really they need to be sent to couples therapy and I wonder how do you break down those assumptions that creep into long term relationships and an agronomist in their, their landowner or farmer is, is a classic one. Uh, I, I won't kind of win any friends by saying this but I actually think we'd be much better off if everybody rotated their agronomists quite regularly because that kind of over comfort that you get through working for somebody for 20 years and, and you both, you've told each other what you know um, you, you, you're looking at, at, at things and, and seeing the same problems, whereas a fresh pair of eyes often, um, often kind of stimulates a different, a different view of it. Now that's, you know, there's a lot against that. There's a, we've got a, an enormously uh, loyal customer base as agronomists, I think, and, and, and that's, that's kind of, you know, uh, that's give us the security. Um, that we that we enjoy, but I I do think that that, that, that over familiarity is stifles innovation. And um, could I ask Andy the same? How, how do you manage that in relation to your relationship with your agronomist? Um, our agronomist has been with us for a very long time, but um, I think I'm always as a farmer, um, whenever possible, I walk around with him when he's on the farm. So. If he says you've got X, Y, Z, I can, you know, we can actually have a discussion. I'm not just going to go and do it. So I think that's quite key as farmers. I think we have to take the blame for some things that happen in front of me because we've just shipped all responsibility away. Um, and so don't be surprised that um, the economists, uh, um, you know, recommend certain things because you haven't been there to question it. Um, but in terms of Rotating agronomists is quite a good idea. I quite like that idea, but you don't necessarily have to do the whole farm. You could give one agronomist a quarter of the farm, and then you've got the comparison, and you, you're almost comparing the two. Um, so you don't necessarily have to upset your agronomist for 40 years by kicking them out. So I quite like that idea. Um, but again, it doesn't necessarily, those new pair of eyes doesn't actually have to be an agronomist who's there all year. It could be someone who comes in for a day, two days, three days, has a look, and goes through all the figures, goes through all the applications and says um, why are you doing this, why are you doing that, so you're almost, um, you're assessing the agronomist down the farmer, which is kind of what I, some of what I do as well. Okay, Gary? Yeah, just just slightly different I guess, I'm just sitting here thinking that, that traditionally um, agronomist has been to cheat yield, I guess, is that correct? You know, that's what you want, 
So in this new world, if you like, do you think, I'm going to ask you a question actually, um, do you think that um, agronomists in terms of a regen agricultural um, situation uh, needs to look at margins? So, and I'm, and I'm calling the margins obviously seed, fertilizer, chemical, which is fine, the standard variable costs, but the key thing is moving into labor and machinery uh, costs as well. So in my opinion, but I don't know what you think, to, for, for the agronomist to be successful in advising a farmer in regen agriculture, they need to be looking and monitoring labour and machinery costs as well, which is, I guess, is a new world to you boys? Yes, no, I mean, we, we've, we've dabbled with that for a long time, but um, I, I think the um, proliferation of benchmarking um, availability has probably helped that, helped to inform that debate where we've got some more figures more widely available because more more benchmarking groups are available and i think i think that is useful and and we should be encouraged um and i think benchmarking as a as a kind of a platform or to create a platform for knowledge exchange i think that might be one of the one of the real um uh, sort of roles for agronomists in future is in facilitating that that knowledge exchange because we're learning at a similar rate to, to our farmer customers. You know, it's not like we're rolling out the uh, the expertise from a big R and D base in terms of uh, some of these regenerative practices. We're learning at the same rate as, as our customers are, and you know, if we're only learning at the same rate, then we can't necessarily um, bring bring the kind of uh, technology to them in the same way as we could when we were releasing a new chemical every year. But we can use our, our sort of network of, of, of kind of contacts to then uh, help to that knowledge exchange to work and facilitate that knowledge exchange because there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, knowledge that's going to uh, gonna, gonna play a big part in, in, in getting to grips with, with these kind of different system-based approach. Okay, a question here? I think uh, a lot of it's going to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, base UK, I'm a member of. Um, there's some, you know, go to a base meeting. There's nearly 200 members now, I think, and that's a fantastic. It's been two, three days at the conference. It's a fantastic knowledge sharing. Because um, this is this is why I started on the abacus and the groundswell is because as a farmer who's been doing it for 20 years, I actually have the physical knowledge of how to set up the drill, how to do this, do that. Whereas you can't expect an agronomist to do that. So I'm coming from a different perspective. I don't necessarily call myself an agronomist in the same sense as Mark is. Um, so I think, I think it's just it's, it's um, educating yourself and taking that responsibility. And that knowledge can come from a one-off visit from someone like myself or from whoever it is, or um, Base UK, YouTube and all that, all that kind of stuff. Be careful what you read on the internet because there's, there's a lot of people selling a lot of stuff or well, selling their books. but. Um, I think there's a lot of knowledge out there. It's just going on farm walks and learning and um, finding finding somebody who has the same sort of interest as you. Um, I agree that there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge. There is also a lot of um, non-product related um, knowledge created by the people who make the money from selling the products. So if you look at all the distributors and, and to, to a probably a lesser extent the manufacturers, then a lot of the work that, that is done that is interesting is not associated with product use. But the business model isn't well set up to supply that because if you make your money through, through the profit of selling products and then we move to systems where you sell fewer products and clearly the, the, you know, the, 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 the finance stream dries up. And we've been, you know, if you talk to any distributor, any, if you talk candidly to any distributor company, then you'll see that the, the business model is under some stress because, because that, that uh, free, uh, sort of constant stream of new products which allows the kind of profitable sale of, of, of those products into the market has been supplying a lot of the 
uh, knowledge generation and knowledge exchange, which, which we're all benefiting from, and uh, some of us are paying for. And that, I don't mean to duck that question about, about the uh, splitting advice from supply, because it's, it's been a real question in the market. And I think the danger, the danger of doing that on just a kind of a purely ideological basis is that you lose part of the set, part of the uh, support industry, which is funded in that way. Uh, and I think a better way is to is to monitor it and to uh, to make sure that the you know to repurpose the skills rather than to lose them altogether. Okay, thank you. There's a question at the back. So the question and the comments. I I take all those points, Hazel, yeah, and you're absolutely right. But I go back to what I say that that uh, while the knowledge is is being generated in that way, it's still it's being paid for through the kind of product sales uh, system, and that's the difficulty. That's the thing that we will have to uh, try to address if we are to retain all that useful knowledge that's generated um, and, and not lose that not lose that capacity when as and when the, the, the profitability reduces or continues to reduce from, from the sale of the product. And, and the, you know, the independent industry of which I was a part for a long time is, is great, but it, it, it suffers from a lack of income to, to generate the R&D and the, and the input into developing these, these areas. Uh, so it, it finds it difficult to, you know, to, to replicate that. It, it's, it's a very imperfect system. Okay, thank you. Well, there's a question right at the back. Um, we'll take the one on the left first and then the one on the right. Um, I was just listening to Tim Parson earlier. You know, he was saying that the regenerative approach really is anything more technical, um, thank you, more technical perhaps than a conventional approach. And, you know, Andy made the point that perhaps there'll be a whole suite of advisors for different components of one. Do you think we're just in danger, unless you're really engaged as a landowner, and perhaps you have got a handle on biological and physical processes which you you know you haven't heard of before, that we're just going to swap one set of variable costs in terms of pesticides for another set of variable costs for advice? And how do you think you're going to get landowners perhaps who have just got used to a passive, prescriptive approach to engage with this stuff so they're not going through the I think it's down to the landowners. You know, that's the that's the landowners kind of uh, issue. If if you want to be engaged in your farm, you've got to get involved, and you've got to uh, accept that, that that it is a complex system. It is, you know, there is a lot of detail to be to be dealt with. And if you want to subcontract that out to somebody else, and that's that's also fine. But you've got to then set up your uh, your agreement with the person to whom you're, su you're subcontracting it, so that you make sure that we're all working in the same in the same direction. And, and that was what was behind my kind of um, my profit share margin um, approach was where it was uh, arranged with people who were less engaged in their in their day to day agreement, um, and, and they wanted to, to have it have it done by somebody else, but but know that they were that we were all working to the same brief. But it, it really is about about re-engaging people with their with their with their markets. Now, 
uh, there's, there's several things that I think have contributed to disengage farmers to um, to being engaged with their own agronomy, including the basis basis qualification, which is com you know compelled through the red tractor insurance schemes. Uh, that's a hurdle to to, to, to decision making for farmers. Uh, the complexity of the pesticide market. And, and the diversification that goes on, uh, which stretches management time. So there's lots of hurdles, but those engaged farmers uh, who were really interested in the, in the in the growing of crops on their farms, they they, they probably, as Andy says, they, they probably ought to be having more than one specialist to come in to to glean from their expertise uh, and then pick up the, you know the best bits out of each of them. I think, from personal point of view, the lack of BPS in seven years is going to sort those farmers out. They won't be able to afford having five, you know. The advisors won't afford, be able to afford a different scuffle every three months. You know, there's, there's going to be some services that people say, well, we can't afford that. Now, Australia, you know, they, they have, they're, they're, their costs are so low because they can't afford it. Um, so all these fancy pictures, etc., etc., us as farmers can have a look at the line, bottom line and say, well, that doesn't give me £20 a hectare value. That's got to go. It's making my life complicated. I think that's... Regenerative agriculture should be using advice to reduce costs, um, but you've also, with that, you've got to accept that things won't necessarily, they're not 100%. Like, we've had pesticides, you know, have worked almost 100% for the last 50 years, and it's been going down and down, obviously. But in regenerative agriculture, you've got to accept that some things are going to work differently every year, different to the weather. And having that's a difficult conversation to have with, with a client or a farmer is that the system we're going in, I can give you advice, I can't guarantee you that it's going to give the same result every year. Um, whereas we have been used to do T0, T1, T2, T3, and we get nine and a half ton, boom, done. That's that's going. So it's going to be, there's going to have to be some change on both sides. And I think the lack of BPS will soon sharpen our pencils in terms of. How many advisors you take on? Okay, thank you, Karen. Yes, yeah, so, so um, I think on the, the same point that, that what I've noticed in, in all of our clients um, uh, across the board is that many farmers now are taking on agronomy themselves. Um, farm managers, in particular, are, are qualified, almost qualified agronomists themselves, and doing the agronomy themselves. So, so and I think there's been a big move to that. Uh, we, be we benchmark you know, thousands of acres and we have a top 10%, top 25 of the average, and we do have a bottom 25 group as well. Um, but the top 10% and top 25 are really qualified agronomists who are farmers. Um, and I see the future needn't be extra costs because, because the agronomy is taken in-house and then they need um, uh, what we call, uh, today called agronomists, but they're not, they're because they're, we need consultants who advise on the regenerative agriculture. So to, to help the farm managers and the manager and, and the farmers themselves who are the agronomists. And I see that as the future. I don't know if that makes sense to you to you boys as agronomists, the three of you and Richard as well. Because that's the way I see and that's what I uh, I'm observing with all our, our clients. Um, I think you, what, what we've said about EPS reduction, we do have a top a top 25%, top 10, but the bottom 25% group, and that's where I believe collaboration will come in in, in terms, of, in terms of, of joining up with farmers and, and raising, raising the bottom 25. Um, there's no talk about them going out of agriculture, going out at all. It's a matter of, of learning from the others, and, I, and I'm a firm believer in collaboration uh, in terms of not contract farming as such, which I don't believe in personally, so that's another subject, but um, share farming um, and machinery syndicates, and, and we, we've developed a combination of machinery syndicates with share farming, and we've seen a huge difference in terms of bottom 25% people joining those groups, uh, where within that group there is what I would call a professional farmer who is also an agronomist. And that and, 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 and making that group work, they then will then will then buy in consultants like these, I guess, uh, on the region agriculture side. And that's how I see the future for. And I think also it's not a criticism, but we've been used to being addicted to buying the solution, and we're now seeing the system as being the solution. And it's having that confidence to trust in your own observations and knowledge, and trusting that the, the system will be the solution. 
Um, we've got two more questions uh, on the left. Um, would you like to go first, sir? Yes. Um, a couple of things. Yeah. Um, one is have we got enough new crop varieties for the change? Are they suitable we, you know, without getting another disease resistance? And from Gary's presentation, if the bottom line is similar, what value does a panel put on soil improvement? Andy, would you like to go first? In terms of the varieties, I think it's it's definitely key um, on, on farm at home we're growing um, blends and we're growing new one a, a different one called nelson we're certainly looking at different different types of wheat um, and going to different markets but i think the breeding is changing because i think it, it has all been based on the conventional approach but they are trying to bring in old old, old traits um, and, and improve varieties so i think do we have the correct varieties for um, for um, Regen Ag? Maybe not yet, but they're, they're coming. Um, and if you look hard enough, um, you can be inventive and do variety blends and stuff to help mitigate those those kind of issues with certain varieties of disease. Uh, and second question on um, the value of soil. Um, for me, it's resilience and risk. As Gary said, you know, an average <laughs> farmer is a regen, was it 100,000 less? Capital? A hundred, a hundred th on a 750 acre farm, there's 100,000 less capital employed. So it, it's, it's more, it's having less capital outlaid, and you have a wider range of crops, so if you have a bad year, six out of nine will do okay, and three might do badly, but you've only got two, three crops, and two out of three do badly. You know, you might, comes the same thing, but that's a bad way of saying that, but um, <laughs> you understand what I mean, you're spreading your risk more, because regen ag means having a bigger rotation, wider rotation, and it's spreading your risk, personally, and um, I think the farm margin should be should be higher on average over five years, um, I hope they kind of answer your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark? Uh, on, on the point of genetics, then, then yes, obviously we we need to apply the, the kind of um, the market forces to genetics. It wasn't until we lost a lot of the aphid control uh, opportunities that we had BYDV resistant uh, uh, wheat and barley varieties. So when there is a need, then then solutions are found relatively quickly, um, and we need to you know demand demand the, the 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 traits that we're looking for from the varieties that we want to grow. Um, as far as the values, land values go, I get a bit lost thinking about you know different um, measurement systems for carbon and, and organic matter and you know subjective um, uh, kind of measures of soil quality. Um, so I think that the benefits that you see year on year through through the resilience that you you generate through better soils is is the reward for it rather than rather than an increase in in land values i think very difficult to to do that within a kind of a landowner contract farmer kind of an arrangement um i think i mean it's interesting in terms of valuing soil health there are figures around the world and there are there are numbers on that and i think it's just we're not in the habit of actually Realise what those numbers are, and it's not actively talked about. So I think there is evidence to you know, to show, in terms of improvements in soil health, um, the reduction of draft requirement. You, there are things that you can actually measure. So um, it's just not commonplace to measure those things. Um, and there's one last question just behind the folder. Um, there was the last comment. Gene editing could help as well develop varieties. Well, my question, I remembered it off, was your comment about a fresh pair of eyes. I mean, working for a, a large economy business that you do, surely colleagues um, can do that a lot. So specialists within your business can contribute to your knowledge as well, such as environmental specialists, IPM specialists, soil specialists, etc. 
Thank you, Hazel. That's a good prompt. Yes, we can. We can do all those things, uh, and and that is one of the benefits of a of a larger company that, that you do have specialisms or sp specialists who can who can address different parts of the um, parts of the, the requirement. Going back to the comments before about having having more than one specialism, more than one agronomist, then then there's no saying that you can't have more than one agronomist from the same company or more than one specialist from the same company. But, um, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, what, Gary, have more comments? No? Okay, well, we're coming to the end of this session, so I'd just like to thank you all very much for attending. I'd like to thank our panel of experts for their time, and I'm sure they'll be around for a few minutes if anyone's got any burning questions, but um, if you could show your appreciation. Thanks.